Hey there, guys. Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 21. Hey there, guys. How's it going? Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 21. My name is Chris Chillingworth. Thank you very much for joining me on the show. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, inflation and the cost of living. And listen, I'm one of those kind of people that uh, gets this idea in the head and then ends up spending an entire day going down a rabbit hole. Uh, and I was reading a book uh, about investing and it was talking about cost of living. And I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. And they were talking about inflation in this book. This book is back from the 1940s and they're talking about inflation in the 40s. And it made me think, well, I, I don't actually know what the rate of inflation is in the UK right now. I've got an idea, but I never really looked into it. And so I've spent <laughs> pretty much best part of the day digging, you know, going deeper down into this rabbit hole of UK inflation. And it's been really, it's been quite an eye opener for me. Uh, I've learned a lot today. Uh, and this is typical of me, really, It's kind of sort of stuff that I do. Um, and so I thought I'd talk about it in today's podcast, because it's really interesting. Uh, and I think it might add some value and make people have a have a little think about things. Because um, the UK's current rate of inflation in January 2023 was 10%. And that's based on data provided by the UK Consumer Price Index, the CPI. 10% rate of inflation. Uh, highest we've seen, in, I mean, I've gone all the way back to 1989. And I was, at that age, I was seven. So the best part of my lifetime, we've never seen an inflation rate as high. Uh, we saw it in 2022 when all this kicked off. Um, so it has been as high as 11% in October 2022. But yeah, we're still massively right up there. And we started to see this starting to kick off in terms of this, this jump in inflation really started to kind of hit new territory all the way back in August, September 2021. And the rate of inflation went up to from 2% to 3.2%. And at that point, I mean, 2% is relatively high. Once it hits 3%, that's kind of entering into new territory. And I'm looking at data that goes all the way back to 1989. And we have had years, certainly in the early 90s, where we were higher up at like 4 or 5%. But we quickly surpassed that here in the UK. And by February 2022, we're up at 6%. The next month, 7 The next month, 9 uh, And it went as high as 11 And yeah, it's, it's we're still at 10%, still right up there. So it's quite high. <laughs> Um, it's the third highest across the entire globe. So Italy is second. This is just January. Italy is second at 10.7%. Russia topped that table at 11.9%. So if you're a Russian citizen living in Russia, you are feeling it more than anyone right now in terms of the cost of living going up. However, it's not just those countries. The cost of living has risen sharply across the entire globe. And I think it was Switzerland that had had been hit the least at about 4% in January. Um, so the Swiss are doing okay. But <laughs> for the rest of us, uh, yeah, uh, the cost of living has risen sharply. And we've all felt it, of course. Everyone has noticed it. Some more than others, of course, those lower down... Uh, the bread line, those with lower incomes are really feeling it. Others, obviously, at the other end of the spectrum, probably it doesn't affect them as much. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a thing and um, it's very high. Uh, and I'm not looking at this necessarily from a, you know, being able to afford your bills and being able to afford the groceries. I'm looking at this as an inv more from an investment point of view. Um, so 2022... The whole year rate of inflation came in at 9.1%. So over the course of 2022, prices rose by 9%. And this means that any capital that was sitting as cash lost its spending power by 9% last year. Or in other words, the, the cost of things on average increased by 9%, largely driven by the increased cost of groceries, uh, travel, hospitality, so like, you know, staying at hotels, uh, restaurants, and energy prices. All of that kind of led the way, really, in terms of price increases. Um, in order for your capital to simply maintain its current spending power, 
you'd need to be achieving over a 9% annual average return. Otherwise, the spending power of your capital is eroding. Um, and just to kind of give us some sort of, uh, not a visual, because this is a podcast, but to kind of paint a picture, if you will, um, somewhat audibly, of the cost of things and where it's all going. So in 2019, the cost of an 800 gram loaf of white sliced bread in the UK was one pound one pence. That was the average cost of a slice of white, uh, a, a loaf of white sliced bread. By 2023, this has increased now to one pound 39, being the average cost. So from one pound one pence to one pound 39. Uh, if the current rate of inflation continues in 2023 and we see another 9, 10% year, then by the end of the year, bread will have risen to about £1.53 per loaf on average. Obviously, different brands, different higher amounts, you know, this is a range. Um, but the average cost of, 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 of a loaf will go from one pound one pence in 2019 to £1.53 by the end of 2023. In 10 years' time, if the rate of inflation continued as it is today over the next 10 years, we'd be paying about £3 for a loaf of bread in 10 years' time. Uh, However, the the, the low-priced items such as bread are not typically where people like investors, essentially, will feel the pinch the most. Uh, In 2019, the average cost of a meal out for two people at a mid-priced restaurant came to about £55. For two people, just for one meal, at a mid-priced restaurant, about 55 quid. In 10 years' time, at current rate of inflation, if re- inflation was to continue in this, this vein, uh, that would cost about £143. So, essentially, it goes from 55 to 143 quid. So, triple it. In 2019, a low-cost budget airline flight to Spain from the UK cost on average about £140. In 10 years at the current rate, this would stand at about £400 for a, uh, a low-cost budget airline flight to Spain. In 2019, the average cost of a mid-level specification laptop was about £715. Today, that figure stands at £786, and in 10 years' time, it would be just over £2,000. So, you know quite significant change in in the world so that's quite a big deal you know when you get to the more expensive items um, costs expenditures you see that these uh, these compound in terms of growth just like your interest would do on your savings or your capital uh, likewise, at a rate of growth at like 9% a year, let's say, you know, then the cost of things becomes quite considerable. Uh, and it's, you, you know, you can picture that world where uh, a cheap flight to Spain is £400 or uh, a mid-priced restaurant meal for two comes in at £150. You know, this is a lot more expensive. And this is realistic. Um, it could happen. Uh, now... You know, that depends on whether the current rate of inflation continues, and it probably won't. But it's interesting to look at this, because I don't think we're going to see it go down back to its normal levels for quite some time. And we may see it go down, but it's not going to go down overnight. It's going to take a good year, maybe two years, before we start to see it return back to where it was. Now, according to money.com, which I've done some research today, the average person in the UK has about £17,365 in their savings. Uh, 34% of adults had either no savings or less than £1,000 in a savings account. So a third of all people in the UK don't have any savings. Whilst 61% of adults save money. So two thirds of, of, of us all put some money aside. And the average person has about seventeen grand in their savings. In 10 years' time, at the current rate of inflation, £17,365 will have the same spending power of what £6,400 would have in today's economy. So if the inflation was to continue at this rate, 
If you had 17 grand, you think of all the things you could buy today with 17 grand. In 10 years time, you would only be able to buy the same equivalent amount of items as what 6,400 pounds can do today, if that makes sense. So the cost of everything is going to get higher out there in the world. And your 17 grand will not stretch anywhere near as far as it could do today. And, you know, the famous Jim Rohn, I've said this before, I think I even said this in last week's episode. If you think investing is risky, wait until you get the bill for not investing. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, and I'm definitely not that kind of person. Uh, I tend to avoid doom and gloom, you know, prophecies and forecasts. I'm not interested. I'm just going to keep doing my thing, keep working on it, you know. Um, but let's be fair, let's, you know, look at this reasonably. It's unlikely that current inflation rates will stay as high as they are forever. Now, I've looked back at the historical inflation rates in the UK dating all the way back to 1989. And typically before, I mean, we've had, we've had periods where inflation has risen as, as high as five, six percent, and it's lasted a couple of years, but it's typically sat on average at about 2.5% a year. That's an average over the last, what is that, 35 years roughly. So you can typically expect on average about 2.5% a year inflation rate. However, like I said just a moment ago, we're unlikely to get back to 2.5% anytime soon. It's going to take some time. And again, looking back at the historical data, which if you want to take a look at it, you can do so by going to uh, rateinflation.com and there's some tables on there. You can look at that. Um, but I mean, in 1989, inflation had risen to 5%. It gone up to 7% in 1990, 7.5% in 1991. And it took some years, you know, we're looking at a good period of about five or six years before inflation got back down to where it was typically sitting. And we've had a few years here and there where it's been up at 3%. 2011, it was up at 4.5%. Um, but it's it, it, the point basically being it doesn't change overnight. It takes several years to, to change and to move and to kind of get back to its mean average, if you will. But the big point I want to kind of put across here is that we've never seen negative infl inflation well, not since 1989, there's been no negative inflation. The cost of living has always gone up each year. So then the question becomes, well, what can I do about this? Because if my capital is sitting in a savings account and it's not really accruing any interest, then my money is eroding at quite a significant rate right now, 10% a year right now. That's not cool. <laughs> um, that's not something I'm comfortable with. So the question becomes, well, what can I do about it? You know, what can I do about it? And most people don't know what they can do about it. How do you stop that? How do you combat inflation? Well, the only way to combat it is to put your money to work and turn it into more. And of course, to maintain the same spending power at today's rate of inflation, your capital has to beat inflation. So it has to achieve a 10% return per year. And that's just to maintain its current spending power. Now, there are many different vehicles that you can use to achieve that. And I'm not a trained, qualified financial advisor. So I am never going to give you, you know, regulated advice on which investment vehicle you should choose. That's entirely down to you. And, you know, I'm not in a position to to tell you what the right thing to do is for you and your situation. It's not my, that's not what I do. Um, but some of your typical options would be, you know, traditionally bonds, stocks, property, businesses. You could start your own business, like a side hustle or a full-time business. You can also invest in art, in whiskey. There's loads of different things you can invest in these days, other collectibles. Personally, of course, I love stocks. That's what I do. Uh, there's several reasons why I love stocks. Um, off the top of my head, they've got a high liquidity, uh, which means you can sell them almost instantly and get access to your capital if needed. So that's whilst I've got no intention of selling my stocks or taking my capital out of my investment portfolio, I could if I wanted to. And that's a nice thing to know. You know, if you've got it tied up in a business 
uh, or in in property, it's you got to sell that property. That can take ages. That can be knock on. You know, when you're on the property ladder, there can be knock on chains that are going to delay you from getting your property, your your cash out of that investment. Uh, with stocks, you just have this exchange where you can buy and sell, and you just literally go on there and you can just sell your stuff, get your money. And I like that aspect. I like knowing that I can get access to my capital if I need to. Uh, they produce cash flow, of course, in the form of dividends, which is very important. You can invest in whiskey, you can invest in art, but this is just capital appreciation. You're just hoping that it's worth more than you paid for it further down the line. With things like stocks, you are, and, and certainly property, when you're looking at rental incomes, uh, you are, you know, you are able to achieve some sort of cash flow as well in the form of dividends when it comes to stocks, and that's a, a big positive because. You're getting cash coming in. You can you, you can make decisions with that cash. You can do more with it. it gives you more control. Um, you can you can buy them uh, in a stocks and shares ISA with tax free returns on your profits on the first twenty thousand pounds you invest each year, which is generally plenty for most home based retail investors. So if you open a stocks and shares ISA, then you get a twenty thousand pound allowance every single year. And on that £20,000 or up to whatever you put in, even if you put in £1,000 a year, it's tax-free returns. And that's not just for year one, but year two, year three, year four, you know, whatever. Uh, up to, All the way up to year 20 or however long you, you do it for. Um, and you pay tax on, you only pay tax when you sell them. So if you are going to hold on for 20 years, you're not going to be paying on tax on them for a good 20 years or so. Um, but uh, so that's how that works. And... That's a, a, a massive plus as well in that respect. Uh, you can limit the risk by only investing in highly profitable stocks with a high probability of appreciation in value over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so that's a massive plus for me. And that's kind of part of knowing what you're investing in. You know, I, I, I understand stocks. I get them. I've spent uh, a decade studying stocks. Uh, and investing in them and knowing what to invest in and what to stay away from. And that's a massive plus for me, of course. And also, it's really easy to set up a broker account and just get started, you know. It's harder to get started in property. Um, not impossible, of course. Loads of people do it. But with stocks, you just got to open a broker account. You don't have to go anywhere. You can sit at home. You can do it behind a computer. You can do it in the evenings when you're not at work. It's very simple. You know, um, and I like that aspect. I think it's a great starting point for people when they start to invest. It makes sense to me that one of the first places that you want to start putting your surplus capital, and I, I refer to it as surplus. Obviously, I don't mean <laughs> you don't need it, but it's not required to cover your expenditures. You know, you're pumping it into a savings account right now when actually you could be putting it to work. Well, one of the great places to get started in making your putting your money to work for yourself is in stocks that's the kind of starting point and perhaps once you've built up a huge enough portfolio you can might maybe think moving into property one day but uh, stocks you know again another a reason why stocks are great is you don't need a lot of capital to get started and I know in property you can get started with very little money down um, there are even some opportunities for the right kind of uh, determined people determined entrepreneurs who can get started without any money down they just invest other people's money uh, and that's one way of doing it but with stocks again it's very simple to get involved in and you can you can get started with I would recommend no no less than 500 pounds because of the transaction fees you know you don't want to be buying 100 pounds worth of stocks because you're paying 12 quid in transaction fees for the for the privilege uh, which means you're 12 percent down from the from the very beginning so generally speaking, what I recommend my clients do is that they build up a bit of a, a cash sum, uh, no less than £500 when they come to buy in stocks. And so for some people, you know, if they're only putting £100 aside every month because that's all they can really afford to do, then they're waiting five, six months before they buy any shares and they just buy them on a six monthly basis, which is fine. Um, but yeah, so um, again, another reason why stocks are are what I personally prefer and I think it's a great starting point for investing but ultimately if you want to maintain your spending power of your capital over the next 10 to 20 years you're likely going to need to be achieving at least a 5% annual average return on it 
more if you're going to want that to grow. This is 5% just to maintain your spending power. And that's assuming that inflation goes back down. It should do. And I'm fully expecting it to do so. But how long is that going to take? You know, we're going to be sitting here in 2025, 2026, still looking at 7% inflation rates. Who knows? Um, but assuming it's going to go back down and it eventually go back down to the sort of likes of 2.5% in the future, um, then you're going to be wanting to achieve a 5% annual average return just to kind of really give yourself that buffer. And, you know, of course, should you want to begin investing your capital, then you have to identify the investment vehicle that is right for you. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'm not the person who can advise you on that. I am not a financial advisor. I cannot tell you the right investment investment vehicle for your situation. I'm not um, regulated by the right bodies to be able to give that advice. And so I don't and I would never do that. Um my bag and what I do and my speciality is for those people who have decided that buying stocks is the way to go. Instead of just going out there and just picking any stocks that they think might be good enough, I can provide expertise on the right stocks, the best companies to invest in based on my analysis. And again, I'm not going out there and saying you need to buy this company, you need to buy that company. No, what I do is I analyze the stocks, I do all my research, I present my findings, and I share this with my client base. And it's up to them to decide what to do with that information. But what it does is it gives them, it, it allows them to make an informed decision because they were previously uninformed. They previously didn't have the time to research all these stocks. You know, it takes hours. You've got to read 10 years worth of annual reports. And I put all that information into a PDF or a full report for them, which they can read in about 10, 15 minutes, but otherwise would have taken them best part of two or three days to compile. But I take all the guff out of the, the, the information and I just present the key facts that make a difference, that mean something, so that they don't have to read all the extra stuff that's literally wasting their time. And some of my clients, they just, they're, they're busy people. They don't have the time to be doing all that analysis, but they want the end result. They want to know, right, what is the right company to invest in and why? Why would I invest in this particular company? What is it about them? What are they doing? What makes sense? Where are they going? What's the growth strategy? All that information is in there. And they make their own decisions, you know, and they decide how many to buy, if they buy any at all, when to buy them. You know, I, pro I provide analysis on the price and I say, this is the price where you're getting the best. You're getting a bargain. This is the price where it's okay, it's not a bargain, but it's all right. And this is the most I would pay for this particular stock. And that information is readily available to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's updated every single day after 6 p.m. The data gets refreshed and updated. And all, the, all of my members get access to that information and they can very quickly decide if they've got 500, 1,000, 3,000 pounds to invest that month. Well, everybody's buying stocks on different days. And so all they're doing is they're logging in to the, the website, to their members platform, and they're looking at this information and going, okay, well, here's the stock I want to buy. What price is good? Is it at a good price right now? Is it at that level? If it is, I'm going to buy it. If it's not, I'll either hold my capital and wait till it is, or I'll look for another opportunity that's on this list that is currently priced at bargain level. And that's the kind of decisions they'll make. But I leave them to make those decisions. I just provide the research, the data, the analysis. And I present it in a way that makes it very easy to consume, very easy to understand and digest. So I'm not advising people the right investment vehicle for them. I'm not telling them they should be investing in stocks and, and not investing in property. You have to make that call. I'm not even telling people you need to buy X stock, you need to buy this stock. I don't do that. I just do the research, the analysis, and I present that information so that my clients, instead of literally going and going, well, I'll just buy Tesco because I shop there, <laughs> which is a terrible investment decision because what other investments would you ever put your money into just because you like the sound of it? Like, 
you know, you'd have to look at the numbers and crunch the numbers and make sure it all looks like a good, solid investment that you're, you have a good percentage chance of seeing a sizable return on your, on your, on the money that you're putting to risk. That's what a good investor will do. No good investor goes in blind. All the good investors that I know, the people that have made good money, they'll only get into an investment if they're almost certain they're going to see a sizable return on their capital. Otherwise, they won't go near it. And the only way you can do that with stocks is to analyze them, to understand the investment deeply, to understand what's going on in that company. Where are they going? What kind of profits are they making? Where's that profit going? What are they using it for? What's the growth strategy? What do they plan to achieve in the next five years? Does it make sense? Is that a good idea? Uh, and then you can you can watch them as they're going through it every year. The annual report comes out. Are they meeting the criteria that they set out? Are they are they achieving their five year plan? Does this all look good? Are they moving in the right direction? You know, and some companies will put a five year plan together and they say this is where we're going to be in five years, and this is how we're going to get there. We're going to open this many stores. We're going to open them over here and over there, and we're going to break out into Germany because the pilot that we've been running has been working really well, and we know how much it costs to open a store and to run a store on a yearly basis, and all our stores become profitable after two years, and by five years they're all making a profit of about one point six million per store. You know, and you know all that information. And it's like, okay, this makes perfect sense. And then, you know, three years into that, they might turn around and say, we've changed our growth strategy. We're going to do this now. And you just, you, you, you're watching it. You're analyzing it. You're keeping track of it. You're making sure that it's all going in the right direction. And what we're hoping for is that the share price of that stock, of that company, will fall in line with the growth and the success of that business. And that's typically what we see historically. Now, on a, a month by month, even sometimes on a year by year basis, it's not always necessarily directly correlated. You know, the company could be doing really well. We've seen this in 2022. So many of the companies that I found did so well in 2021, 2022, record profits, record. That means the best profits they've ever made before in their history. And yet share price fell down <clears throat> 25, 30 percent. And you think to yourself, why? What's going on? But that was because the share price went down because of the wider economic situation. It had nothing to do with the underlying performance of that business. And so to us, that's a great opportunity because that means, OK, this company is still doing fantastically well. And his history has proven to us and shown us that the share price of well-performing businesses always do well over time. And so when prices drop 20, 30% through no fault of the business, because the performance is still fantastic for an investor, that's a perfect opportunity to buy more. Fantastic. Because if the, if the share price was going down because the company were underperforming and weren't doing well, well, okay, well, maybe they, maybe you want to be questioning, do I want to be buying more in this company? Because, you know, what's happening here? But when the company are making record profits, and you got thirty percent off the share price. That's fantastic. It's like the the best telly coming out in in the electronics store, and you've been wanting this telly for ages, and it's amazing. And they just brought out the brand new model, but it's thirty percent off. And you're like, wow, that's a great opportunity to buy my favourite TV that I've always wanted at thirty percent off. It's the same sort of thing. Anyway, so my point basically being, you know, investing is crucial if you aren't going to just sit there. And leave your money sitting, rotting in an account where it's just literally eroding, it's falling apart, it's going to have far less spending power in the future. You have to be putting your capital to work to be co to, to just to maintain its spending power. And more now than ever, because, you know, in the past, all you have needed to make was about 2.5% to maintain its spending power. Well, 2.5% isn't that difficult. 10% a year is difficult and you know the watch list the the uh, companies that I have identified from the date that they were picked have achieved a 16.8% annual average return since 2014 so our watch list our hand-picked stocks the ones that I have found and identified and share with my clients they have a, they have beaten this rate of inflation despite 2022 despite the coronavirus crash despite the Russian invasion of Ukraine you know, despite Brexit, all of these things that have come along and really decimated some of the share prices out there, 
we are still up 16.8% annual average return, which gives you an indication of how well we were doing before all of that stuff came along in 2019 onwards and how well we'll probably be doing once things improve again and things start to turn around, which it looks like they may have done because, what was it, last month we made 10% on return on our, um, our investments. So that's all I'm going to leave you with. Um, just food for thought, really. You know, if you are interested in investing and you have been sitting there for the last year thinking, mm, should I get involved? I think now is the time really where you really want to start sitting up in your chair and doing a bit of research into what the right investment vehicle is for you. And if that turns out to be stocks, then I'm opening an invitation for anybody listening to this podcast to get in touch. Maybe I can help. Maybe there's something I can you know, help you with. Um, I've got a free course on the website. Uh, I've got 10 years of experience with investing in stocks. I can guide you away from companies you might be interested in investing in if they're not the right businesses. And I'll give you a full indication as to why I believe that, you know, and I'm happy for people to drop me a line. So if you feel it would add any value to you, you can email me at chris at thecleantrader.com. It's an old email, so don't worry about the actual the name, but chris at thecleantrader.com. If you drop me a line there, um, we can chat and uh, maybe, you know, maybe we can work together one day. But there is no obligation on that. You know, if you just want to drop me a line and say hi and let me know what you're up to, I'm totally cool with that as well. No bother. So thank you very much for listening, guys. Uh, I hope it's added some value and I will see you guys in next week's episode. Cheers. <laughs>